I have these two images juxtaposed here. The, the, I'm assuming an audience that's at least familiar with the HBO version of Game of Thrones and then the, the larger Song of Ice and Fire. And that's the, the throne that if you sit on it cuts you. That's the one that they're all fighting on. Um, and then there's, there's Aristotle looking rather dour and, and fairly martial. And there's a lot of images of him. And as I was um, reading through the, the first book, the one that's already been adapted for HBO, I was, I was very struck by many of the sort of Aristotelian um, themes and framework when it came to moral discourse, when it came to talking about why people ought to do things, why something is the best policy, what's the good, all these sorts of things. Aristotle provides a very large, dense, overarching framework that I think when we teach Aristotle often doesn't come across. And a lot of this has to do with the, the sort of fragmentation of the discipline. So if you're studying Aristotle in a communications class, you, you read the rhetoric or perhaps the poetics. If you're reading him in a poli-sci class, you read the politics. If you're reading him in, in a philosophy class and it's a metaphysics class, you read the metaphysics, perhaps a few of the other works. Um, if you're doing an ethics class, you read the Nicomachean ethics, but not the Eudamian ethics. And Aristotle's work is actually this cohesive whole. There's a lot of concepts that are being explored um, in one work that bear on another work. And I, I, I noticed that. So when I talk about an overarching Aristotelian framework, I'm talking about one that draws from all of the ethical political works. Um, my original intent, uh, very often when you, when you do a uh, conference proposal, you, you put out this promissory note and then you realize this just can't be done. Um, and the reason why it can't be done for this one has less to do with Aristotle and much more <coughs> with Martin. Um, what, I was, what I wanted to do was to argue, and I'm not actually going to argue this here, I'm just going to throw out some ideas, that Martin articulates a, a neo-Aristotelian view of human nature, of characters, development, and of ethos and moral qualities. And the idea was to reference a lot of, you know, provide a lot of supporting detail, uh, and somehow he's going to do this in 20 minutes. Um, what I wanted to focus on in particular was this notion of community as sharing, but also a locus of, of conflict over moral qualities and judgments. The entirety of, of the Song of Ice and Fire, as we've seen it so far, in, in the five volume, volumes that we have, is of a society that's breaking down, ultimately. That's if you had to do a large picture uh, thing. And it's really about uh, what Aristotle called stasis, or factions, how we often translate it. Uh, I also wanted to look at the motivational interplays between interests, desires, loyalties, and, and common goods in the characters. I want to look at ethos as reflected in both individual characters, uh, many of whom are, are exquisitely developed, and the houses that they, they come from. And then I wanted to look at some of the characters' choices and developments as matters of, of better or worse practical reasoning towards and about the variety of human goods, because it's interesting. Nobody in, in the, these books says, okay, now it's time for me to do some practical reasoning. What would Aristotle say in this case? Instead, they do it. And if you're a good Aristotelian, you don't expect people to, to consult Aristotle with this, because Aristotle was writing about the way that people, in fact, do practical reasoning. Um, now, here's where the challenge comes in. This is where I bit off way more than I, that I could chew in this session, although I'm, I'm now in the process of, of um, putting together a bunch of notes that I'm hoping will eventually turn into a small book. So Martin's narrative sprawls over entire continents. This is the Westeros, and, and as the, the books proceed, you get more and more places in it as well. At this point, there's five over 800 page volumes. The later volumes just seem to get thicker and thicker and thicker, which is, I suppose, what you can do when you're a well-established author. You can put out books as long as you like. Um, there's, by one count, there's over a thousand characters that have been mentioned so far. Now, most of these are not, <clears throat> are not main characters. But even if you just counted up main characters, and there's disagreement about how you do that, there's at least, you know, it's, it's in the double digits, just for main characters. So it's very different than, than you know, looking at a, a, a novel where there's, say, three main characters. Um, it's interesting because uh, Gar um, Martin contrasts himself against Tolkien, who he, he says he's very influenced by. He saw Tolkien as an architect doing this kind of world construction thing. And he sees himself as a gardener. He plants something, 
and then he sees how, how it grows. Um, he, he thinks of his characters, it seems, as sort of developing organically uh, within, within the world. And it's a very morally complex and ambiguous narrative. And again, I think this is where Aristotle can be somewhat illuminating. So let's think about the Aristotelian view of, of character. So Aristotle thought that not only ethics, everyone gets this in their, you know, required ethics course or intro to philosophy course, uh, and they learn about virtue ethics. He thought that not only ethics, but also politics, rhetoric, and poetics, and he has books titled after those, ought to be concerned with the characters of a person. He thinks that if you're doing politics and you're not concerned with character, there's something deficient. He thinks that if you're looking at uh, novels, plays, whatever, and you're not concerned with character, there's something deficient in the is going on. There's four interlocking Greek terms or concepts that fit into this notion of character. One is ethos, the lasting character. You might think of it as the fabric of character to steal Nancy Sherman's book title about Aristotle and, and ethics. And then there's ethos as a habitual disposition. Um, the virtues and the vices fit in with that. Um, there's you see this over and over and over again, running across Aristotle's body of work, this concern with what he calls topoia. It's one of the categories. It's also what um, we're looking at in the poetics, in a, a particular person. It's the how somebody is, the how their actions are, the how their choices are, the how they are. And that tells us what they, they are. This, is, this becomes part of who they are. And then really key is what he calls um, proiresis, a term that if you want to translate it very literally, it means uh, taking this before that. So you can think of it as preference or how you order things. And this is not something that um, just happens in individual actions. Proiresis shows in that. It's something that forms a person's character or expresses their character over time. And it involves some sort of fundamental determinative choice. So do I, you know, do I decide that wealth is really the most important thing uh, and ignore my family when, when the demands of my family conflict with wealth? That would be part of my pro racist. Um, do I try to develop the virtue of courage? How do I understand courage? That would be part of my, my pro racist as well. These are all the things that fit into what Aristotle calls character. So it's what we do, or should do, but don't. Um, what we choose. And then here's where we get to the moral discourse. We, we talk about what we ought to do, or what other people ought to do, or what they don't do, and we, we make judgments on them. Uh, it's how we approach situations, uh, but not just situations, how we approach other people. Do we value them just instrumentally? Do we see some sort of intrinsic value in them? Our actions, other people's actions, even more importantly, temptations, situations where we're actually being tested. That's where pro-racism develops and shows itself. Uh, it has to do with what we value, but not only that, how we rank order, how we prioritize, how we, we make sacrifices between the, the variety of goods that, that we have in our lives. Um, and then what we deliberate about. And some people don't deliberate at all. They're, that's that's going to be a problem. They, uh, they're they're going to have a hard time dealing with certain situations. How we deliberate, what we bring into our thinking about what we ought to do, or what we ought to say, is a sign of our character. So what does Aristotle actually tell us about character? In the Ethics, the Nicomachean and the Eudamian Ethics, he tells us that it's formed by choices, actions, and not only those things, but also how we feel. So there's a quote by Aristotle that's been used everywhere. It's, it's the first line of emotion, the book Emotional Intelligence, that it's not easy to say when it comes to anger, um, when we should be angry, with whom we should be angry, how much should we should be angry. Um, and oftentimes we think of ethics just in terms of humans' actions. Aristotle, and the entire Aristotelian tradition, thinks of it in terms of are we feeling the right things at the right time, for the right reasons, to the right degree. Um, it centers on virtue and vice, habitual dispositions, deliberation, and what you might call person-forming choices. Um, there are some choices that are determinative of who we, we become. And you see these choices being made in the Song of Ice and Fire by some of the, the important characters. In the politics, it gets more interesting. He tells us that any genuine community involves character as a basis. 
and it fosters and recognizes good character. A lot of what we engage in, whether it was ancient Greece or contemporary politics, are discussions about what a community ought to look like, who ought to rule, why, um, what a good person is, what are we trying to, to form. Um, Aristotle recognized this. And then he saw that communities are not only based on relationships, like say being in the same family or owing fealty to somebody, but also on moral qualities, on sharing, he says, or agreement about moral qualities. In the rhetoric, he says a character is actually one of the most powerful and important means of persuasion. And you contrast it against you know, the uh, logos and, and pathos. Um, character also fits into the modes of rhetoric. Aristotle, those who, who are familiar with his, his uh, teachings about rhetoric or communication, know that he divides it up into three basic types, all of which actually do have to do with character. Even if it's forensic rhetoric, which is about the just and the unjust, those are qualities of a person. Um, epideictic rhetoric is entirely about character. You're praising or censuring or blaming something. Finally, in the, in the poetics, which you might say that, that applies most to, to a literary work, character is a, a central component of narrative. If you don't have developed character, you don't have a good narrative, Aristotle says. And how do we judge character? This is why I particularly like Martin, because um, as opposed to some, some authors who just you know, want to show us things from, from the outside, he has all these characters, and he tells us what they're thinking. They go through these interior monologues. Um, they also have discussions with each other. And we judge character by what people do, but even more by their expressed thoughts. And this was a category for us, called uh, the annoyum. He said this is also an element of, of any good drama. And what thought does is it reveals to us the deliberation or the evaluations people are making. Um, these are the sorts of things that human beings, Aristotle says, disagree about and agree about, and share in, and uh, change their views on over time. And there's an entire range of moral categories. Um, some people are more motivated by these than others. And if you look at Martin's characters, there are some people who are motivated just by concerns of pleasure and pain. Others that are reducing everything to usefulness for their, uh, their one drive that's, that's, that's orienting them. And it doesn't necessarily have to be an egoistic drive. You can think of in the, uh, in the fifth book, the growing importance of the, uh, the septons and um, this sort of uh, very austere morality going along with it that subordinates everything to, to holiness. Um, what is noble and what is base? There's a lot of discussion of that in, in Martin, I think. And then finally, you know, the just and the unjust. Not just is a person just or unjust, are social arrangements just or unjust? And, and there's no radical critique like, you know, Marxist commune or something like that, because this is, you know, set in a, a essentially medieval fantasy uh, milieu. But there is a lot of discussion about what, cons what constitutes justice, and should justice be sacrificed for expediency. Um, there's also a lot of moral ambiguity recognized by Aristotle. And again, I think this doesn't get across when we teach Aristotle in ethics classes, uh, in part because we're doing this survey work. Aristotle, if you look at his, his work, and especially if you read his histories of, of things that are scattered throughout the politics and then you know, the Athenian constitution and other places, he sees that the same things can be looked at many different ways. The politics is probably the work where he's best about this. He says, you know, when it comes to these claims about who, who ought to rule or who's just or the way things ought to be arranged, these people are partly right, and here's why, but they're also partly wrong. These people are partly right as well, and they're a bit more right than these. He oftentimes says nobody's completely right, um, so there's moral ambiguity there. Prime example um, of this has to do with you know rule, worth, or equality. This 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 uh, uh, matrix for, for strife and also for for community. And he noticed who has claims on on getting to rule or getting to determine things. The rich. They have some legitimate reason to want to rule. Those of good family, that's much more important, I think, in, in Martin's narrative than it was in Aristotle's time. But if you look at his works, again, you see this coming up over and over again. The virtuous, particularly the just, because justice is the virtue oriented towards others and oriented towards one society. As a matter of fact, Aristotle says that um, 
the other virtues can actually be looked at in terms of justice. So courage, if it's an individual circumstance, it's what I do, say, to protect my fiance when we're about to be mugged. But if it has to do with my going out on the battlefield because that's the right thing to do for my society, that's a form of justice as well as courage. Um, then the free and the many. These are all people who have claims, and all of these claims have some legitimacy to them. Where do we get into conflict, according to Aristotle, at least in, in political communities? One big conflict, and again, you see this in Martin's work, uh, some characters are very interested in the common good. Um, I would say that Ned Stark um, is, although he's, he's, he gets taken in. I would say that Jon Snow is a good example of that. Um, uh, Daenerys is a great example of that as well. Then there's others who are just in it for whatever egoistic ends they have, um, ruling for, for the self, using rule to, to benefit themselves. And I'd say um, most of the Lannisters fit into that category. Um, Janos Slint is a perfect example of somebody who would sell anybody out for anything. Uh, then there's similarities. We, the very fact that we're similar to each other brings us into conflict, and we can have rivalries over all these things, and you see these emerging in there. Aristotle lays out some key lines of division between people. So you might say you're, the type of character that you have or the class that you have will, will bring you into conflict with others. So wealth and poverty. He says, though, it's interesting. Aristotle says the, the greatest difference is not between wealth and poverty. It's between virtue and vice. That the virtuous and the vicious will always be in conflict with each other. Uh, and what does this lead to is, is breakdown faction within the political community. And what's really interesting about um, the whole Song of, of Ice and Fire series is you don't end up breaking down into some sort of Hobbesian war of all against all. Um, everybody wants to have the Seven Kingdoms unified, prosperous, working. They just want it under them for whoever it is that they're supporting. And when, when people engage in, in faction, they often don't they're, they're not in it just, there may be a few characters that you could say, like the mountain, who, that all he likes to do is kill people in horrible ways. Or his brother, um, uh, Sandor, who is, is so motivated by hate that he would like to see the whole thing fall down. But most of them actually want to have some sort of cohesive political community. But they often have very deficient ideas of what that, that consists of. There's some things, there could be some limitations to this, so I'm just going to skip through this very quickly. Aristotle didn't talk much about religion because it wasn't a big issue in his time. Uh, we see that becoming much more of an issue in the fourth and the fifth book. And it's, uh, I'm very curious to see where it's going to go in the, the sixth and the seventh book. He also didn't write an awful lot about dynastic politics, which is what a lot of uh, the uh, Song of Ice and Fire is concerned with. And he didn't think a lot about feudal societies, in part because um, those tended to be, I mean, you could say that there were things sort of like those, but they tended to be outside of the sphere of, of the cultures that he was looking at. So what about Martin's moral world? Well, you see a lot of similarities to Aristotle. He recognizes a heterogeneity or plurality of real and apparent goods, desires, and motives. And how do we know this? His characters talk about them. His characters act on them. He displays persons in terms of character through their, their, their actions and their expressed thoughts. It's almost as if he's, you know, consulted Aristotle on how best to get this across. He also, and this is one of the things I really like about his work, he sets up multiple moral interpretations, not just factual, but moral, evaluative interpretations of the same event or the person or the act or the decision in words and thoughts of others. And you could think, for example, sometimes this is a, a, a crisis point. You could think, for example, about uh, Jamie and Kersay's incest and the fact that the, um, the children born of it, who are ruling, are not legitimate children. Um, Stannis, one of the, the uh, claimants to the, the throne, writes a letter about this. Other people are talking about it. And there's, there's a key moment in, I forget whether it's in the, I think it's in the fifth book, where their uncle, actually, he lets forth a remark as he's dissociating from them, as the Lannister house is beginning to disintegrate, where you see that he now believes it. So this is something very important, I think. Uh, Martin himself never takes a direct moral position as an author. He leaves it up to you to 
sort of read into the characters and listen to them and judge which is actually better and which is actually worse. And again, that's very Aristotelian. Because Aristotle himself, he's got, you know, this is better than that. But he, he thinks that you can't just tell people that and expect them to become good and expect them to get it. They have to see it in actions in the framework. And some people won't get it. A few minutes? Okay. Um, Martin's moral world is a very realistic moral universe, often disappointingly so to, to some. Um, the good is, is real but very vulnerable, requires protection and cultivation, and you see some people like Ned Stark devoting time and attention to that, others um, just exploiting it. Uh, Martin has a, has a habit of killing off extremely well-developed and likable characters, um, and when it happens, it's, well, and then the quarrel hit him and he died. Uh, it's not, you know, very long, drawn-out death scene or anything like that, but that's very realistic. The good is vulnerable, and becoming virtuous doesn't make you invulnerable. Um, Good and evil are intermixed within the characters, and a lot of the characters go through a struggle, especially in their deliberation about are, are there better sides or their worse sides going to predominate. And there's there's a you know real tipping point for some of these. The characters develop morally. Some of them. Um, they deliberate. They follow up moral choice. I'm going to actually close with this. I have I have some other slides where I, I look at some of the characters themselves and um, some of the things that they're saying. But we're, you know we can talk about later. There's an interesting blog, Medieval Robots, and, and I came across this one a while ago. And they were saying that Martin is writing a historical chronicle. And this was seen as kind of a bad thing because, you know, he's uh, interested mainly in the elite. And I give you some, some examples of this. Um, in the article itself, they, they said the most interesting characters are the ones who are, are part of the elite, but are not exactly an accepted part. So Tyrion Lannister, uh, Arya Stark, uh, Daenerys, Jon Snow, um, the characters who aren't well born, they're supporting characters, but they're not really explored in, in great detail for the most part. Um, and I think that this is actually on track. I think that um, Martin is not trying to write an every man's uh, vast novel landscape. He is focusing on, on those. And it, uh, this is another reason why I think Aristotle could be particularly useful in, in analyzing this. Because the concerns of persons are caught within agonistic Aristotelian framework that's concerned with rule, houses, and political community. Um, I go through a bunch of uh, there we go, discussions of um, of um, that. These are the, all the houses, at least most of the ones. You can go on and find lots of nice, you know, pretty pictures of them. This is what I'm going to close with. You notice that all of them have, have words. They call these their words. This is part of what forms their moral discourse. Um, House Stark, winter is coming. House Stark exists primarily as the protectors of the north. That forms their, their ethos. Lannister, uh, hear me roar. The lion is being sort of this, this, this dangerous but vain creature. Um, not particularly concerned with the public good. Concerned with the good of that, that house. Um, house Tully, I'm not sure if you can make it out too well, um, is family, duty, honor. And you see that reflected in, in these characters. House Greyjoy are these uh, essentially modeled after the Vikings. We do not so. They are the ones who go out and take over anybody who happens to be weak. These are all parts of ethos. So that's where I'm going to leave off. And uh, if you haven't read all these books, I didn't want to give any spoilers. I hope I didn't. Um, so thanks.